welcome everybody and welcome to our guests that are have joined virtually and of course a warm welcome to Francesco Dal Grande the speaker of today on connecting the green dots a 15 year deep dive into the lichen algal symbiosis we met each other for the first time in Italy when I gave a talk and a few weeks later in Sweden when I gave another talk and then it was clear that Francesco wanted to do some lichen research. And he started with his master thesis physically at WSL, but from the administration, he still attended the university in Trieste. And the topic was Photobiont Guild and phylogeography of the Ichthyochloropsis species. You will learn what that is. The Photobiont of the lichen Lobaria pulmonaria and the re-evaluation of its phylogeny. Later on, he did a PhD at WSL with the National Science Foundation project on phylogeny and co-phylogeography of the photobiont mediated guild in the lichen family Lobariacea. After his successful defense of the PhD, he moved to the Biodiversity and Climate Research Center at Senckenberg, Later on, moved to Complutense University in Madrid. Went back as a senior scientist to the Biodiversity and Climate Research in Senckenberg. And since 22, he's an assistant professor at the Dipartimento di Biologia, a professor of botany in Padova, in Italy a fantastic university where all of us want to, would like to stay for a while in spring in the Botanic Garden. Fantastic area. Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christoph. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, fantastic to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's especially nice to be here in such an important occasion. And we'll have uh, yeah, time and to talk about this uh, later on this morning and also in the evening. Um, yeah, so first of all, a little disclaimer. Uh, in this talk, in this seminar, I will highlight the progress in the field of ecology and evolution of lichens, but this is a very personal take. Um, there is my personal story attached to it and those of my collaborators and friends and colleagues uh, that follow me along this journey. So it's in no way a complete overview of all the progress done in this field in the past 15 years. Um, but I was putting together this presentation and um, I put it together, it looked like looking back, you know, looking at the past and connecting past and present and it felt like a bit of a fairy tale, uh, to be honest with you. And so if I would like to start this, maybe uh, and telling to my kids, you know, I'll start since it's almost quite some time, like once upon a time in an office, not so far away uh, from this actual room, um, it all started. And it was, um, yeah, 15 years ago that I started my PhD, as Christoph mentioned just now uh, in his group and at this wonderful institute. And since then, quite a few things happened. So uh, the aim of this talk is to give you a little update, or actually quite a dense update, on everything that um, was planted here as a little seed in our minds uh, during my PhD, little ideas, hypotheses, and so on that started back then, and to see how they developed along this uh, 15 years time. And to do that, I would like to use my dissertation. Here you have the image. And um, this dissertation was also awarded uh, the Maison Hale Award uh, by the International Association for Lichenology in 2012. And this is a recognition, um, a very important one that I would like ideally to share with Ivo Widmer, that was my uh, companion in this journey. And you will see later his picture in the next few slides and that we share so many moments and um, so many uh, discussions and analysis together. Um, so I will now, divide these uh, presentations into three major parts. And these are the major topics uh, of my dissertation. So let them uh, guide us uh, this morning. Um, it's a story with two ends that also coincide with two beginnings. And I'll be 
I'll make myself a little bit clear, I hope, by the end of the talk. And there is a lot of science, of course, but there is uh, quite a fair amount also of personal stuff. And a little preface, so uh, these past 15 years have seen a revolution in our field of research. So we are now in the genomic era uh, for non-model organisms and lichens are, I would say, definitely one of the non-model organisms uh, for all a series of reasons that I will not stay here to uh, list. Um, and what was the future back then is now or has been the present for quite some time. Uh, this is due to the massive reduction of the cost of sequencing and the incredible improvement in sequencing technologies as well. And this evolves fast. Uh, we have, uh, you know, more or less every other day, new analytical approaches and tools that have um, been developed at an ever increasing rate. So we have to keep this in mind. And of course, this will be integrated in what I'm going to show you and how this uh, improved or allowed us to answer some pending questions, um, questions that refer back again to the time that I was here as a PhD student. So um, brace yourself. It's 15 years in about 40 minutes time. So it's quite a lot of things. And um, yeah, let, let's, let's start. Without further ado, photobiodiversity. This was the first big topic. And um, I started working very closely to uh, Carolina Cornejo. She's here among us. And uh, the first thing um, we studied was we tried to identify the photobiont, the algal species associated with Lobaria pulmonaria. You will hear this name a lot this morning, um, mm -hmm. or lobby for friends. And um, we soon realized two things that there was an incredibly uh, small diversity. So these species associate with only a single species of photobionts uh, across its entire distribution range. And uh, another thing that surprised us is actually the species that ident we identified was actually not the one that we had in culture. So this was the big uh, first red alert uh, suggesting or indicating that photobionts are not really well known. And there was a lot to do to bring some light um, in this field. Um, so how this concept evolved. Um, as Christoph mentioned, in 2011, at the end, I left uh, VSL and I went to Frankfurt, Germany, in the group of Imke Schmidt, where I started working on a different system. I started working on umbilicaria pustulata, um, another lichen, a saxixel, saxixel one, uh, the one grows on rocks, um, no more lobaria. And there I started again, uh, looking at the diversity of uh, photobionts associated with this lichen. And why this is interesting? It is interesting because there is an interesting parallelism to lobaria, but also something more complex attached to it. So we had a huge collection um, of these species across, again, the entire distribution range. So one of the first parallelism, because also uh, with the 30,000 plus samples of Lobaria pulmonaria that were collected uh, on the year, throughout the years, um, we had again another wonderful data set in our hand. And we soon noticed that this umbilicaria associates not with one species, but with several. But this species of Trebuxia, it's the most common genus of photobionts and lichens, they all belong to the same phylogenetic clade. Clade simplex litarian jamesia, it's clade S, it's called. So we started working in implementing methods, uh, integrating multiple loci, phylogenetic approaches, coalition based approaches, in order to understand better this diversity that was associated with umbilicaria. And this led us to the uh, description of at least five species of Trabuxia, all more or less closely related, all belonging to the same clade, showing that umbilicaria is therefore rather selective for a specific clade in Trabuxia that associated with um, umbilicaria. Once we have this uh, method uh, at hand, um, I thought back at the um, alga associated with lobaria, and that was still a pending story. Uh, we knew that it was something else than what we knew, uh, we knew that there was some hidden diversity. So what we did, I teamed up uh, with some wonderful colleagues from Czech Republic, from Germany, Paul Schkalud, Andreas Beck, and Thomas Friedel. And um, we worked on revising the genus. It was Dictyochloropsis back then. And um, we figured out that actually it was 
uh, important to introduce, it was necessary to introduce a new genus of green algae. And now the species associated with um, Bubaria pulmonaria is, sorry. Yeah, is up here, Symbiochloris reticulata. And you will see here the photos. And as you see, it doesn't associate only with Lobaria pulmonaria, but it also associates with other fungi within the same family Lobariaceae. And together with that, of course, we published uh, other species. And this, of course, showed us that the diversity is um, rather unknown still for many, many photobionts. We then met in Trieste in 2016, uh, with a few colleagues, all interested in the diversity of Trabuxia, the most common genus of photobionts and lichens. And this effort uh, was led by uh, Eva Barreno, the University of Valencia, and our group, and also by Lucia Muggia from Trieste. And um, with, after the meeting, um, and whatever was discussed during the meeting, led us to uh, present this work on the diversity of Trabuxia. And you see the increase in species number for Trebuxia was actually outstanding. Um, and of course, again, indication that the diversity of photobionts is actually woefully underestimated. Uh, we presented now about some 810 species, candidate species of Trebuxia, when the described species until that moment were only 29. There is another aspect of diversity for lichens so it's particularly interesting. And um, this is uh, thanks to the pioneering work of Eva Barreno and her group, and also Lucia Muggia again, uh, on um, the presence of multiple algae within the same lichen talus. And um, as I said, technology improved, sequencing costs went down. So finally, we had some tools at our hand um, to start addressing these questions more closely. What we did, um, I went to Madrid and I was helped by Pradip Divakar and Ana Crespo and uh, their team. And uh, we found a beautiful gradient on Sierra de Gredos and the Sistema Central in central Spain. And where we had a um, very nice um, elevational gradient of populations again, of Umbilicaria pustulata and a closely related sister species, Umbilicaria hispanica. And we used this data set to look closely at the diversity of Trebuxia associated with these lichens. And we had about uh, yeah, 240 thalli of these two species. And we used a meta barcoding approach on ITS2 to look at the diversity. And first of all, well, we didn't find much diversity, only five OTUs, putative species associated with both. And the interesting thing is that in about 20% of the thalli, we had a clear indication that there was more than one algal species inside. So we had uh, more or less equally abundant photobionts um, in 20% of the thalli. Uh, this finding is, was a bit puzzling because if you think of all the Sanger sequencing uh, that was done so far, you know, that was the traditional barcoding approach to study photobiont diversity, how is that possible that we can sequence um, a specimen with Sanger sequencing if inside we have multiple algae that could both amplify with the same primers and their different species. So <clears throat> with a master student in Imke's group, we look at this um, issue a little bit closer and we Sanger sequenced all these 240 specimens and we compare it with the meta barcoding data set telling us um, a rough indication of their abundance within the talus. And so we realized that um, why we got all these sequences. Because if the secondary alga, if there is more than one alga, and this alga represents about 20% or more than the abundance within the talus, this creates trouble. And usually we were not able to get a readable sequence. But for all the others, we're always able to obtain a good sequence. If you think about, I don't know, the 8,000 or so sequences of Trebuxia that we have in GeneBank, this indicates, suggests, that um, usually for lichens, we have only a predominant photobiont. Doesn't mean that it's an only photobiont present, but it's definitely a predominant one, allowing you to obtain the Sanger sequence. Time to move to the second macro topic, fungal algal association patterns. And this one is exciting. Uh, so again, this is Ivo, Ivo Vidma, 
uh, was my colleague or symbiotic companion along this journey. Um, we're all together here at Vetshead. And um, we did some, um, quite some work in dealing with what was um, probably the most complete data set um, that has ever been produced for lichens, putting together um, genetic diversity of the fungus and genetic diversity of the alga using microsatellite loci, 10 for the fungus, seven for the algae that we developed. And um, we had this at our hand. So we met with Helen Wagner, an uh, incredible uh, ecologist uh, from Toronto, Canada. And uh, we started, uh, we, we realized that we have something special at our hand. We could finally answer some pending questions on the ecology or biology of transmission of the lichen symbiosis that we couldn't before. Uh, so thanks to Helen uh, proficiency at statistics and uh, our grit, um, we could find um, some new interesting things about this symbiosis. Uh, we could, for example, for the first time, quantify the effects of uh, mutations versus recombinations in the two symbionts. We found that the alga is mainly distributed clonally, and it's clearly dominated by only a signal of mutation, as you can see here. And for the fungus instead, um, we found uh, in that in the population, Tali were more diverse. You see this peak here, comparing the microsatellite loc locus diversity between pairs of Tali, we have Tali that were more diverse. And we could quantify the relative contribution of recombination in the fungal population. What was interesting is that for all these 140 populations, 4,300 Tali, we also had spatial information for the populations. So we could use that to extract and to calculate at what distance these processes were acting. And we found out that vegetative dispersal dominates the spatial genetic structure of the symbiosis at very short distance. So it's like a way of the symbiosis to spread around locally uh, fast, and this spreads both the fungus, but importantly, also the photobiont. And we'll see in a moment why that is especially important. Um, the other work we did, having this data at hand, was to look at um, the spatial distribution and the phylogeography of both symbionts. And things get interesting when you put them together. So again, this was the dawn of the holobiont perspective on lichens. To be able to understand better a system, not as simply the sum of its parts, but of something else that comes together and behaves uniquely. And we found that um, for this data set, um, Fungus and algae were not randomly encountering themselves in, over the space, but were actually like a rather fine-tuned valves. And if you see here in the area of the Balkans and South Italy, um, we had a hotspot of diversity of geographically restricted alleles, telling us that these two shared a long history together. And this is an indication, of course, of coevolution between these two lineages. Uh, what about the progress we did? And what about umbilicaria, you may ask me, right? Uh, so there in Frankfurt, we didn't know much about the fungus. We had traditional barcoding data, but we didn't know much about its genetic diversity. As I said, sequencing cost goes down, so we decided to go for uh, genome skimming of populations. Uh, we did that along elevational gradients to have, you know, some um, ecological diversity and um, different biogeographic regions involved. And um, we sequenced using a pool seek approach, pools of individual uh, DNAs. And uh, we ended up with a panel of about 400,000 fungal SNPs. This allowed us uh, to first describe the genetic diversity in the fungus. This is uh, what is represented here on top is only for one elevational gradient, but the story is the same for all other two free gradients that we studied. And we always found a pool of population, a group of populations located in the Mediterranean um, bioregion, and a pool of populations instead, a group of populations located in the temperate oceanic climate. Um, thanks to the work and the collaboration of uh, Burka Budel, um, we looked at their, uh, if there was any fitness difference between these two genetic lineages of Umbilicaria pustulata. And interestingly, we found that the red group, let's call it here, reached photosynthetic optimum at lower water content than the blue one. And this is a clear indication that um, this may be 
really climate adapted uh, lineages. So now we call them uh, umbilicaria ecotypes, fungal ecotypes. With that said, and as I said, we started metabarcoding the algae in the umbilicaria system. So we were, again, in the lucky position to put this thing together and to try to understand the symbiosis by combining the fungus and the alga at the same time. And then again, strikingly enough, it's a very nice parallelism to what we saw for Lobaria before. Uh, we have again a similar population genetic structure of both algae and fungi with communities of algae. And we speak about communities because we don't have a single photobiont, but we have a pool, a set of different algae belonging to the same Trabuxia clade, but some diversity at least, uh, located in the Mediterranean uh, habitats, in the um, Mediterranean environments, and preferentially interacting with um, the fungal ecotype also located in the Mediterranean region. And this was a fun one. So uh, green alga sharing. And also Christos smiles because it was a topic of long, long discussions. And at the beginning we could even uh, believe that this, we could, uh, that this could be found in, in the green alga symbiosis. Uh, this all started from the pioneering work of Yuko Rikinen on cyanobacterial symbiosis. Um, and he found, uh, Rikinen found that um, the nephroma guild, so a set of fungi that show uh, high selectivity towards a common pool of cyanobacteria. So if you look from the perspective of a single species, you may not see much of selectivity, but when you raise up the level and you see it from top, and you see the entire community interacting, you will see that these lichen-forming fungi are somehow all connected. And how they are connected? By sharing a common pool of photobionts. So we thought with Christoph, we had a wonderful system at hand here to check these hypotheses also for green algal symbiosis. And we uh, traveled to Madeira in 2009 and Taiwan in 2010. Boy, it was really an amazing fieldwork time. Um, and there we had these um, rich Lobariesian communities on trees that we sampled. Uh, thanks again to Christoph's skills with sticks to pick, you know, tallai from the top of the trunks to have a very nice um, picture of the entire community. And again, we used microsatellite data to identify the multilocus algal genotypes and to check if there was any sharing going on. What we found that was indeed sharing, what is called now the symbiochlorase mediated guild. So all these fungi, here we have the example from Madeira. So starting here from the left to the right, we have Lobaria sublevis to Lobaria pulmonaria. And you see that all these species, at least two, three at a time, they share a common set of algal genotypes. They share the same alga. So they're all somewhat connected. Again, reinstating the, the hypothesis that we have these fungal communities in which we have source species that distribute the photobionts, usually are the vegetatively reproducing ones that are dispersing at short distances, as we saw from the study before, the photobiont um, in the stand. And then sink species that are like the um, sexually reproducing ones that will spread their fungal spores and take advantage of the presence of the photobiont in the forest stand. What about Trabuxia? Um, we're still working on that, um, but we had a strong indication that also for Trabuxia and the Ubilicaria system, something like that might be in place. Um, we have data here from the metabarcoding study. And so we don't have level really of the geno multilocus genotypes, but we see that two species that are often sympatric along this elevational gradient share only a disrestricted number of algal species and often the same one. So it's reasonable to assume that also such a um, mediated guild, photobiont mediated guild would be uh, in place for this system. Third chapter, drivers of symbiotic association. And here I start directly with the work that we did in Frankfurt because it developed uh, some of the ideas that we wanted to test uh, during my dissertation work. And uh, this was a wonderful collaboration with Gregor Rolshausen, an evolutionary biologist, um, a freak of a statistician, and uh, Imke Schmidt. Uh, well, we have this, I told you, this wonderful data set of Umbilicaria pustulata 
um, collected along the entire distribution range of the species, 120 populations, about 2,000 individuals. And we use the information, the spatial information, to extract uh, bioclimatic variables from all the populations and to quantify the climatic niche of both fungus and alga in these symbioses. What we did was to calculate um, Hutchinsonian's niche hypervolume of a particular Trebuxia species and compare it with the hypervolume, the complete hypervolume of all other Trebuxia belonging to the same system. So the forefront species in blue, bluish here, tint, uh, is the one that was superimposed on the complete hypervolume, that is the gray area uh, underneath. And this allowed us to show that, um, to display non-overlapping portions of these hypervolumes, indicating a unique contribution of that trabuxia to the entire algal niche space. And it's particularly interesting in these two cases here in the bottom. Let's start with this, OTU alga 5. You see that this one contributes uniquely in this area. This area that, if you look at the PCA here, the environmental variable, corresponds to places that are warmer and drier. And vice versa, this one here, OTU4, contributes uniquely to parts of the niche space of the buxia that are colder and wetter. So if you look at their habitat suitability predictions, it's not surprising to find OTU4 up here north and OTU5 here in the Mediterranean. The interesting thing is that when you do the same for the fungus, that you can also put these probabilities, to, um, these distributions together and calculate an encounter probability to show you that the symbiosis is actually, as I said, a fine-tuned valve, but it's also a mosaic of interactions. And overall, the distribution of suitable habitat for Trebuxia was larger than that of the mycobiont. This allowed us to put forward the hypothesis that the microbiome could actually expand its range by associating with specific Trabuxia strains that are better performing, especially uh, towards colder and wetter climates, in the case of OTU4, if you remember, or towards warmer and drier climates, so at the extremes of the ecological conditions that the species is facing. So symbiosis, again, like a mosaic of interaction hotspots, where more specialized partners become available and they can meet it, each other, and cold spots where more generalized partners are instead um, meeting and forming symbiosis. But having this um, data, we started asking ourselves, where does this switching occur? Is this something unique for um, the Umilicaria pustulata symbiosis, or can we start um, making it more general, generalize this concept. So Imke on her sabbatical went to California and sampled some incredible gradients, elevational gradients of a, another Umbilicaria species, Umbilicaria fea, um, on Sierra Nevada and Mount Jacinto mountains. And uh, we barcoded the predominant algae in this system. And then we used that to look at the distribution and to calculate exactly where the algal switching was occurring for both the umbilicaria, as we already started, the umbilicaria pustulata, that we already started knowing quite well, and also for this new symbiosis. And we found that there were actually predictable switches along elevation, and we had these abrupt beta diversity turnovers in both systems, suggesting therefore parallel niche partitioning for both uh, lichens. And while checking what were the conditions in which this turnover was happening, we found that this altitudinal turnover zone was rather confined for both symbioses. And it corresponded with a mean temperature of the colder quarter of five degrees Celsius, indicating a transition from the Mediterranean to the cold temperate bioregion. In order to put together, let's say the, one of the last pieces of the puzzle of the holobiont, uh, we definitely wanted to look at bacteria. And here again, we used metabarcoding, 16S metabarcoding. And here we find ourselves again on the Sierra de Gredos gradient. If you remember before, with the algae and the fungus and with the umbilicaria pustulata and umbilicaria hispanica species. And here we studied the same specimens, the same DNAs, amplified and metabarcoding using 16S. And here we noticed that the switches 
do not involve only the algae, but also involved the bacterial communities. So we could start thinking of concerted switches in the holobiont. But let's look closer at the bacterial diversity and community structure. And we found altitudinally structured bacterial communities. And we had pronounced turnover. You see here these gaps, one and two, with the three colors. And this turnover were both within and also between the two hosts, between the pustulata and the hispanic cyst as well. You can see here, up here. Then again, we quantified um, the climatic parameters um, that were happening in these uh, turnover zones. And this corresponded to two very nicely defined altitudinal belts. We're looking at the, again at the gradient. Um, it's possible now to conclude that the most frequent combinations of species, fungi with their ecotypes, algae with their species diversity, and bacterial communities with their composition and structure, uh, in this lichen holobine system, correspond to Mediterranean, cold temperate, and alpine climate zones. So this is a strong indication that in the holobionts, we have these compositional changes that are kind of response to climatic factors. So it was impossible to understand more about the holobiont if we weren't approaching it when in this you know, holistic way, from a holistic perspective, taking all the biomes together and looking at their interaction. It's also important, of course, to understand their individual response to the environment, but also to put the things together as we started back then in, during my PhD. The last chapter looks at um, nowadays, and this is a collaboration with an incredibly talented team in Toulouse of Pierre-Marc Delot, his postdoc Jean Keller and PhD student Camille Pouginier. Um, and we started thinking of trying to identify the genomic basis of lichenization. So here it's not one, not two, but several steps back. What makes a photobiont a photobiont? And for that, remember 15 years past, technologies improved. We have now PEC biosequencing. We had algae that finally started growing. We had enough biomass to extract enough quality DNA. So we produced several genomes. We obtained several genomes of these uh, green algae. Uh, all the trabuxia that are talked about here for the umbilicaria system, for example, and several other photobionts scattered across the green algal tree of life, especially for the family that contained photobionts, so the trabuxophytes. And we also sequenced some close relative that never was found in symbiosis, so that we had pairs of symbiotic and non-symbiotic algae. And thanks to the work of um, Pierre-Marc Delot and uh, collaborators, um, we reached these conclusions. Uh, first of all, we didn't find uh, any specific feature or you know, the, the general genome characteristics are the same for both lichen-forming and non-lichen-forming chlorophytes. Um, we could detect at least two independent gains of the lichen-forming ability in chlorophytes, um, one at the basis of the trabuxiophysi and one at the basis of the ulvophysi. So there is not a single gain um, that uh, you know, preceded this uh, um, diversification. And interestingly, we found some hints that um, of specific features in the lichen-forming algae. So there are some certain gene families, expansions um, in lichen-forming algae, and these expansions are associated to stress tolerance. So we have members of the desiccation tolerance toolkit, for example, as was indicated already by the nice work on Trebuxia of Lucia Muggia and Fabio Candotto Carniel in Trieste, and uh, carbohydrate metabolism. And of course, it's not by chance that we are ending with this because I need to come back to Zurich, right? So this is an opportunity for me to come back to Zurich. And you will ask me why. Um, also for us, it was a big surprise actually. And the big surprise was this. This is an example of what we found that um, will bring us back to Zurich in a moment. So one of the gene families that was expanded, actually in this case, almost exclusively present in lichen-forming alga, 
was this um, GH8, glaze hydrolase 8 family. Um, this seems to be uh, to have been acquired by a horizontal gene transfer from bacteria concomitantly with the evolution of the lichen forming ability in the trabuxophyce. As you see here in blue, we have all the algae that are most exclusively lichen forming, and all this pink are bacteria, all carrying this um, GH8 member. And the interesting thing here is when you think about the function of this gene, GH8 members can cleave either fungal polymers, such as chitosan, or beta-1,3, beta-1,4 glucans. And here bring us back to Zurich. Work of Rosemarie Honegger, 2001. Lichenin is present, is abundant, and we have a thick outer wall layer of the medullary hyphae of the fungus. And most interestingly, and that's a big surprise, she found out that in hyphae that contact the cellulosic walls of Trabuxia cells, the outer layer was found to be less prominent. So could this GH8 be involved in some sort of recognition process, making you know, the interaction um, surfaces closer to each other? To test, then we tested the specificity of GH8, and it was a happy moment when we found out that this GH8 that was um, recommonly produced from Asterochloris glomerata, one of the green algae for which we have the genomes, thanks to the work of Daniele Armaleo and colleagues, showed a typical lichenase activity and a specific one too. So it could not cleave cellulose or ketosan. It was really actually cleaving um, lichenin. So that was the first end of this seminar. A scientific one, right? But we are here for another reason. So you'll ask me, what's next? Um, what's next scientifically is that we still have much more work to do. As I said, an end is always a beginning. So after finding these hints for uh, functional roles of these fungi and of these um, proteins in lichen forming algae, uh, we want to understand better. Uh, we need more genomes, especially to cover the Ulvophyce clade, especially the Trentopolia algae, because they are rather different in uh, both biology and also in their ecology. Uh, we can find great communities that are free living that eventually will associate with lichens. And we want to compare them with what we found in the Trabuxiophyce here. Then something that I never gave up and an idea, a small, tiny side project that we started, I, by the end, I think, of my PhD with Christoph, was the detection of a free living pool of photobionts, which is really difficult to detect because it's always, it's, you know, carrying over some fungus, so you can never be sure that they're really actually free living. So in a project of my PhD student in Germany, co-supervised with Imke Schmidt, uh, Lukas Dreiling, um, we looked at um, microbiome of barks in uh, Germany in 150 forest plots. So we had tons of samples and um, where we metabarcoded um, three types of communities, green algae, of course, fungi and bacteria. And we have some hints that Trebuxialis here with many representatives that can be potentially symbiotic are an important component of this um, microbiome bark community. Another thing that I started and I'm continuing in Padova is a collaboration with Fernando Maestre, an ecologist um, from Alicante, Spain. And he offered us his incredible data set from his ERC funded project Biodesert on um, the desert biodiversity or dryland biodiversity in soil. So we metabarcoded 80 soils from all over the world, from drylands. And also here you'll see Trebuxia which is more or less entirely lichenized, um, that it's uh, quite a prominent clade and, uh, in this um, community. So we have hints, we are working towards that. Now we started isolating these species and hopefully we will see some uh, free living photobionts soon. But here we are again. So scientific now is over, I would say. Once upon a time in an office, not so far away. So, this was a wonderful journey. Thank you for embarking with me on this, um, on this ride. And uh, you saw that technological advance 
and uh, passion and tons of collaborators, collaborative work, collaborative science brought us closer, allowed us to answer, um, you know, long pending uh, questions or address long pending hypotheses. And more importantly, allow us to formulate new ones and to ask new questions. And while preparing this, I, you know, it's needless to say that this wouldn't have been possible um, without all the colleagues, friends, and collaborators that I met throughout these years. So I did a little exercise. This is a temporal holobiont or the temporal continuum, you know, the holobiont that becomes time. And my way to thank all the collaborators that helped me along this journey um, was to list them in my mind. So here they are. And I said, thank you for each one of them. And I would like to propose to you to do the same. You should take a few minutes of your time in your day and think about all your collaborations, all the colleagues, friends, colleagues, all the discussions that you had, all the moments when science became alive, when you were sitting and discussing and challenging each other and moving forward together. And use that as an end point and start from there and walk back in time. And you should go back to the point where it all started. Well, for me, the point and the moment where it all started was meeting Christoph, who believed in me, who gave me a chance. And he became my mentor and um, he supported me along this journey. You know, he, he instilled in me the awe, the passion for lichenology and supported me, of course, in this attempt, in this very personal journey, but also collaborative one, in trying to address some of the lichen secrets. So, thank you, Christoph. <laughs> and of course, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Francesco. Are there any questions, please? Yes, we have to run with the microphone. Otherwise, I start with one. You showed this fascinating diversity within the Trebuxia. This is novel. I mean, when I started, there were a few species morphologically being identified, but that was it. What I learned during my studies, Trebuxia has also lost sexuality as a result of their life as a lichen symbiont. So I have two questions. Is that still correct? <laughs> and the second one would be, how is evolution going within this genus that has lost sexuality? I mean, that's then probably the same story within Symbiochloris in Lobarias or Lobarioid lichens and in the Trebuxia with the, the no, more normal lichens. What yeah. is your impression now? Yeah, um, well, the impression derives from the work of uh, Daniela Maleo that um, published recently the genome of Cladonia grayi and the associated photobiont Asterochloris. And um, that was used for cloning uh, the GH8 and transforming. Um, there actually we have indication from their genome that um, they didn't lose the um, sexual apparatus. So apparently evolution still works, you know, in according to the um, expected way of recombination and uh, sexual propagation. But of course here the, the bottleneck and the, the missing link is to find free living population pools that where these would be actually allowed to happen. Because as we know, there are maybe few reports, not maybe even convincing that um, sexual stage of the books that was found. Um, Asterochloris is closely related, but we are talking about the same group of algae. Um, what is, would be possible now, and I think it started in the group of Imke Schmidt um, soon after I left, was to use these genomes that I showed you um, to go further, you know, in this um, in this attempt to really characterize um, the yeah the genes involved in sexual reproduction in the species, but they all seem to be present. So, a uh, straight answer will be that it's as expected, you know, sexual species that doesn't show up much 
in the ecology when it's in lichen uh, association, but still the possibility is there that there is a combination. Thank you. More questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for following the talk. Um, this is something that we haven't addressed. Um, this is something that would be possible now that we started acquiring, now that we get the genome, because these were, you know, metabarcoding data for tracking diversity and population structure, dynamics of, um, of Trebuxia, um, but we didn't have enough, um, or, you know, that kind of data that would allow us to go after these questions. Um, I think interesting here would not be only, so I would not answer specifically to the question, but I think it's a very nice direction for future research. What will be especially interesting is to check from where or when the fungal ecotypes also split. Because now, like the data are there. Now we have um, genomic data for this fungus as well. And to see if somehow this was driven by, you know, a sort of, um, let's say, uh, dawn of speciation in these species uh, with this ecotypic differentiation that we found both in Spain or in Italy um, along replicated gradients, or if it's something independent. Uh, what we know is that this Trebuxia associates also with other lichens outside of the genus, for example. And um, so it's, uh, as we said, also it has a broader distribution in ecological, in ecological terms. So the histories there might be different, but this is something definitely worth checking. So sorry not to be able to answer directly the question, but we don't have information about that. But that was an excellent question and actually an excellent point for um, going forward. Thank you. Are there more questions from the virtual audience? Otherwise, Gesa, please. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned this um, dispersal strategy, this vertical dispersal of both photobiont and fungal partner in Lobaria pulmonaria within populations that you did with these 3,000 something insanely many samples. Um, so how far does this um, vertical dispersal, like at what scale does this act? Is this just within a single tree or can you notice it on like neighboring trees or does it actually expand to several kilometers? Yeah, it's uh, not several kilometers, but um, what was estimated based on 4,300 samples 4, uh, <laughs> was that to be precise, um, was that the vegetative um, signal dominates the population structure until about 20 meters. Okay. So it's really a local stand that is affected with that. And as you move forward, you will start seeing more um, different multi-local genotypes popping in in the population and in the community on the tree. So it's about 20 meters for Lobaria pulmonaria. And that counts both for the photobiont and the Yes, that partner. was also actually done together. Yeah. Looking at uh, clones, actual clones yeah. of the symbiosis yeah. to be sure that we're talking actually about the uh, comparing pairs of tale and looking at delta zero. So tally that had zero variation in their multi-local sets for both the fungus and the alga. And which partner, in which partner the delta, does the delta like change quicker? In the fungus. In the fungus, yeah. okay. The, the alga is dominated by clonality all over. What also Christoph was hinting, um, recombination is extremely low and undetectable yeah. actually with this kind of data. Um, although, you know, the genes, they might still be retained in the genomes for a recombination for sexual propagation, um, but it's the fungus showing much more diversity, and also this clear signal of um, recombination at delta four, delta five, and so on. You have the secondary peak. The first one is the delta zero mm -hmm. or delta one, like where mutation maybe uh, will just change one of the locuses, 
Um, but then the fungus shows much quicker, also some more variation, as expected, as we know that in Lobaria we have this apotecia. So we know that a sexual recombination in the fungus would definitely be there. Okay, let's try with this one. It works, yep. More questions? Otherwise, I would have another one uh, with the, I mean, this distance decomposition of the clonality and so on. Did you try that with Lasallia or Umbilicaria pustulata? Because the, the two species systems, they share the possibility of both vegetative dispersal and the sexual, uh, sexual dispersal with ascospores and subsequent relichenization. Yes. I don't know if Imke is listening, but these were like, uh, you know, a bucket list for <laughs> future papers. <laughs> um, no, we haven't tested that. And um, the, the gradient was actually a good one because we had these um, potentially the source and sink species of the photobiomediated guild. We have Hispanica that is predominantly sexually reproducing and Ubilicaria postulata was predominantly vegetative with this Isidia and that can, you know, colonize uh, easily the uh, local short distances. Um, we didn't do that because we didn't have um, that kind of data that would be required for this analysis. So um, we didn't have, for example, microsatellite data or SNPs data for the algae. And the, the difficulty here is that I showed you that there is always a predominant, or mostly there is a predominant photobiont, but there might be also other algae in that same talus, maybe a 10% of the abundance or up to 20% of the abundance in most cases. But these make things difficult because when you have a SNP panel, a SNP set, you will never be able actually bioinformatically to distinguish between the different closely related tribuxia. So in order to track this and to extract um, you know, informative SNPs, this has always been a bottleneck for this system. Uh, now we are dummy culture, we also have the genomes. So one thing that would be possible maybe via maybe some mapping, very conservative mapping approaches, maybe to try to um, you know, tell them apart and to start investigating these processes. Um, but so far, we could only do that looking from a community perspective with metabarcoding and looking at how much the community were shared or were different among these. Um, so at the host level comes very nicely, nicely. We see that there is overlap, but there is also more diversity in the source species, which will be expected with the fungus, you know, um, trying out maybe different types of algae or although belonging to the same clade and the uh, less diversity in the postulata system. But more than that, so far, it was not possible. Thank you. Um, I have another follow-up question on the um, uh, photobion transfer. Um, do you have any clue of possible vectors? Is, uh, is it still simply mediated by water and wind? Or do you know if also animals might be involved like yeah, snails or mites can be uh, vectors. It was, there are papers showing that you can find viable trabuxia cells actually in the fecal pellets of snails. Um, so this could be one of the vectors for sure. Um, I think precipitation also rain um, would also act uh, both for vegetative propagules and um, photobionts, especially when maybe you have uh, cracks on the talus exposing the photobiont layer, this could happen. Um, what we're doing, um, there is a project that I'm a collaborator in, in the group of uh, Paolo Giordani from Genoa University and Giulia Canali, which is a PhD student. They are looking at um, diversity within uh, precipitation components. So we have stem flow and fruit flow, and um, that would be you know, a data set or kind of um, samples that will allow you to test these hypotheses as well. To see also, for example, in rain, if we can detect these strains, for example. Um, but so far we know that there is also a possible animal um, insect vector. Thanks. And there's a question in the audience. Yes, we have a question from Martin Grube. How do habitats differ in the study of bark microbiomes with either chlorellales <laughs> and trebuxiales? Uh, chlorella is more exposed. Did you also study dentrophiliales communities on bark? And also, thanks for the brilliant talk, um, with my best wish, especially to Christoph. 
So greetings. thank you, Martin. <laughs> yeah, greetings to Martin. Thanks for the question and uh, thanks for the words. Um, we haven't looked at um, the individual ecological um, niches of uh, Chlorellalis or Trabuxialis yet, um, although the data set will allow for it. What we were interested in here, uh, it was mainly to look at um, forest land parameters and especially land use management, because this biodiversity exploratory project uh, where we metabarcoded uh, bark biofilms um, across Germany um, aimed at answering this kind of question. So that will be something interesting to, to check, of course, but we haven't done it yet. Um, what we know is we identified um, like few driving parameters for the communities of, as I said, uh, Chlorinalis and Trabuxialis, but we don't have information about their ecological uh, preference. Um, also, the forest stands that we sampled in were rather homogeneous, especially for the study that I showed you with this um, co-occurrence network. I uh, wouldn't expect actually, actually much difference. And um, the problem there was, or the, or the fact, what we found is that it was really low light at the um, height where we used for sampling. So we didn't have you know, much tally to work with. We had little tiny propagules of lichens and um, a rich community of uh, whatever on the bark. And that is actually what we targeted. So in this, this kind of uh, data set wouldn't be probably the best to answer this question, but for the entire data set, where we have these three regions in Germany, um, that's again, something that could be done. But unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Thank you. Is there a last urgent question? Urgent. Otherwise, I would really say thank you, Francesco, for this brilliant talk. It's fantastic what happened during these last 15 years. Algae are becoming interesting. And <laughs> this is extremely nice to see. And you mentioned a couple of times this term hollow beyond mm -hmm. and it was until 1861 that lichens were really considered hollow beyonds just unique or unique individuals or species having a green component and the hyphal component but nobody knew that these are actually symbiotic organisms and it's thanks to the outstanding microscopical skills of Simon Schwendener, who found out that lichens are symbiotic organisms. Of course, with all additional aspects of what that, hap uh, that means for nature, it is not the, the winner, the strong that is the winner and that dominates the world. It's the cooperation among different organisms that can colonize the extreme environments. And I'm pleased to give you a small booklet, a duplicate of my <laughs> too big library that I still have. It's oh. this uh, last part of the Laub and Galertflechten by Simon Spender. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you.